I hope you're ready, friends, because I have some dates for you. And you should know me well enough by now to know that dates are not the most important thing for me as a historian. Um, but some dates inevitably just matter. And so what you're looking at here uh, is a map of Europe with a little inset of the map of lower central Italy. And I call your attention to the red circle. There you might see a city called Naples, and around there you might see both Herculaneum and Pompeii. And I call your attention to this thing right there. It's Mount Vesuvius, because on the 24th of August in the year 79 of the common area, Mount Vesuvius erupts and buries Herculaneum and Pompeii. I don't mean like get like buries it with like four inches of snow. I mean buries it with 20 feet of volcanic ash. That's it over, it's done, it's buried. And it isn't until the 18th, seven, or the, the 18th century when Herculaneum and Pompeii are excavated. I mean, they were wiped clear of the, of the face of the earth. And in 1738, Herculaneum is discovered and large scale excav excavations begin. And then the decade later, Pompeii, the same. And as a result of this, there was an increased interest in the classical past in a way that had been dormant for several centuries. All of a sudden, ancient Rome begins to matter a whole lot. And an art maker who really exemplifies that is this guy here. If, if one were ever to just talk about one neoclassical painter, and we're kind of going to talk about one neoclassical painter this is our guy. His name is Jacques-Louis David. And you're looking at a self-portrait here from 1798. I want to tell you a little bit about this guy and why he was such a petulant child and then how he became such a great art maker. Because he does. He In 1766, he enrolls at the École des Beaux-Arts. And the École des Beaux-Arts was the officially state-sponsored by the King Art School in France, it still exists to this, every, to this very day. Um, it is, for all intents and purposes, the Harvard of French art schools. This is where the best art students studied. And you primarily learned one thing at the École des Beaux-Arts, like formally taught, and that was drawing primarily drawing of the male body, but you learned drawing. And when you wanted to learn painting, you learned painting by studying with a separate professor, often in a different studio. Now the École des Beaux-Arts had something called the Prix de Rome. Actually, the Prix de Rome still exists to this very day. We can call it the Rome Prize. And every year it was given out to at least one student and it allowed the victor to study at the French Academy in Rome for a period of five years. The, the Rome Prize had the same kind of competition every year. And that is the students who wanted to enter were given the same subject. So um, one, of, one of David's uh, paintings is the death of Patroclus, right? It's a scene from like book 10, um, of the Iliad, so the death of Patroclus. Um, so your every artist does the same subject. Every artist has the same size canvas, and they give you two months, and they say the winner, the best painting, wins the Rome Prize. This was the kind of thing that very much made your career. Um, if you if you if you won this, you were pretty much guaranteed support. And so David, our guy, he applied for it in 1770. He applies and loses. The next year he applies and loses. The next year after that he applies and loses. In 1773 he applies and loses. And then he attempts to starve himself, which I think is such a such a great move for any grown up. He's like, I'm gonna take my ball and I'm gonna go home. And then finally, in 1774 he wins. Good job, Jacques. It only took you five tries and you, and you pouted like a small child, but at least you finally won. And so he goes to Rome for five years. Um, and I'll tell you something, as someone who's been to Rome a lot, Rome's fantab fantabulous. You wanna go to Rome, you wanna stay there for five years. Um, and so while there, he embraces 
Renaissance art, classical art. He loves Michelangelo and Raphael. Uh, he loves Caravaggio. He loves all that stuff. And he comes back uh, and, and, and is a new art maker, right? And you should be. I mean, I've told students at Tech when I take them to Italy, I said, you're going to come back a different person, right? It's going to change you. And so he comes back. And in 1783, um, the, 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 the king of France, King Louis XVI, um, wants a painting. And so he goes to David, uh, and David has become remarkably well-known in this time frame. And he says, Jacques, I'd like a painting. And Jacques says, Your Highness, I'm honored. What would, what would you like it to be? And the king says, You know, Jacques, you're the painter. I'm the king. So how about this? You can decide the subject matter. I would just like that it be morally instructive. And David says, morally instructive, huh? And the king says, you betcha. I'd like there to be a moral message. I'd like the people to learn from it. That would be great. And David says, well, I think I know what to do, but I think I need to paint it in Rome. So if you're willing to pick up the hotel bill, off to Rome I go. And the king says, David, go do your worst. Give my regards to the Trevi Fountain. So, so David goes to Rome. And he comes back in 1785 with this painting. It's called the Oath of the Harati. It's in the Louvre. And as you can see, it's a pretty big painting. Either that or I'm a midget. And so it's a big work. And it has been, it's a story taking from the foundation of Rome. And I want to, I, I want to talk a little bit about it. And and if I were a better art historian right now, I would show you a picture of a painting that's in the Capolini Museum, which I, I'm sure I've seen before, but I've never paid much attention to. And this time I saw the painting. It's, it's a fresco on the wall of the museum, and it was done in the 16th century. And it's a story of the Horatii. So in the very beginnings of the Roman world, Rome is at war with another city-state in the Italian peninsula, Albany. And there are two families in those two places. One is the Horatii family and the other is the Albans. And after this war has gone on for several years, eventually they decide to settle it in the old school way. And that is as if some, some weird twist of fate in Rome, there is a, uh, I almost a pair of triplets. There's a triad of triplets. They're the, Horatii, the Horatii. Here they are. It's Huey, Dewey, and Louis of all the names, right? Huey, Dewey, and Louis, Horatii. And as if by some Shakespearean twist in Alba, there's another, another uh, pair of triplets, the Alban twins. Their names are Manny, Mo, and Jack. I know it sounds hard to believe, but that's true. And so you have Huey, Dewey, Louis, and, uh, and uh, Manny, Mo, and Jack. And rather than let all the people of these two, of these two city-states perish, they decide to send one another uh, these triplets to go duke it out to, for ultimate supremacy of the Roman way of life. And so I give you the finished painting on the, on the, uh, the, the left-hand side, and then your humble instructor. And this is one of his favorite paintings. And yes, not once, but twice, I just referred to myself in the third person as if I'm a basketball player in the NBA. Wow. Uh, so this is me in front of it, 2013. And I've always had a special spot in my heart for this. There's some cool sketches that David did of this, of this work and him trying to figure things out. So he worked through a bunch of different ideas until he came to this one. Now, as a way of thinking about this image, I want to talk about the hierarchy of arts, because in the 18th century, there was a certain expectation that if you were a great artist, a really great artist, you did historical paintings. That's what great artists did. If you were good, but not great, you did historical portraits. If you were pretty good, you do portraits. If you were, I you would do landscapes. If you were decent, you know, you might do still lifes. And if you sucked, you painted flowers or something. But there was this definite hierarchy. And part of that involves the creative process um, for all of this. So imagine, imagine I'm going to paint a landscape. And somebody once told me the highest, the name of the highest hill in Louisiana. I can't remember what it was. It's like, you know, 400 feet tall or something. But imagine I want to go paint that magnificent peak. 
certainly there are elements of artistic intent that are, are part of my job. But generally speaking, I haven't really created the scene. God did that. I'm just painting what God made. But if I'm doing a history painting, what I'm doing is taking a historical text, be it the Bible or Ovid or Homer, or in this instance, a, an 18th century French play, and I am forced to use through my own imagination, all of my artistic skills to create the scene that you see before you. So there's just a different level of artistic intent to say nothing of the intellectual um, intellectual rigor and might involved of interpreting a historical text and the fact that you're working in a large scale. So a second ago, I showed you this. Um, the, these are grid lines, right? So this is how you go from a small scale drawing to a great big composition. So David is working through these ideas. And get this, David also does a small scale color study of it. And by small scale, I mean, this is like four foot by six foot. <laughs> so, you know, just bang this out to see how things were going to work. And you can see he kind of remained true to everything. So let's start with what we're looking at. We can divide this composition in sort of into like three different parts. And those three different parts are mirrored by the three different arches here. One, two, three. And this archway, we have our three sons. We have Huey, Dewey, and Louie. And their, and their father here, his name is Donald. Over here, we have the women. And the women have been shown decidedly different than the men. I mean, look at these men here. Aren't they strong, masculine, forceful, purposeful? Haven't they been shown as if they are on a mission and ready to do good work? <laughs> you can see here they're embracing one another. They're wearing their fancy helmets. This one's got a lance. And they're all saluting their father who strides forward, holding their sword, they raising their arms, pledging allegiance to do whatever they can, not only for one another and their father, but their entire way of life. They are pledging that they will do everything. They will give up everything, including their own lives, for the betterment of all. I mean, certainly personal glory might be a part of that but they're willing to sacrifice their own lives for the continuation of the way of life of everyone. These men are shown, I beg your pardon, manly. They're doing what's right, even when it's hard. And the women, in contrast, are just a puddle of mess over here. They're weeping and crying. They've been shown almost like the children. So men, strong, women, emotional. And here's dad. When, I, when I've seen this in person, I've always been overwhelmed by just the detail in like muscles and the glean of helmet and the shadows. And if we think about it actually in another kind of way, we can also think about the colors and the setting. Like we have red here. Absolutely, we have red. I don't wanna say we don't have red, we do. We have a little bit of blue but isn't the composition overall kind of muted, austere, not super bright. I'll call your attention to some colors that are not present. Light greens, light blues, robin egg yellows, pinks. This look like a happy painting. No, as a matter of fact, look at the architecture. Look at the flooring. This is old school Greece stuff, right? We have Roman arches, I grant you, but that's a plain and austere as you can get Doric column. This is a painting that is serious. And so we think about this subject, the distance in time between when this historical event happened and when the painting happened is like 2,500 years. And that's why it's neoclassical, the new classical. And we will see how the art makers who will follow, the romantic artists, aren't going to look to the classical past. They're going to look to last week's newspaper. And that's going to be a really important idea. When this painting was displayed at the annual French Salon in 1785, it was hung on the line. That's a phrase 
for given a place of particular honor. This is called gallery style hanging. And when the exhibitions happened, let me go back. Exhibitions happened. There was no empty space on the wall. You crammed the thing full, but all of the great paintings were hung up high so you can see them far away. So even when this was firstly displayed, it was acknowledged that it was a big and important painting hung on the line. When it was put on display in 1785, the people who came to see it sort of understood it. They understood what David was probably trying to say. What's the moral here? What's the message? Because if we think about these three guys, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, here are three women. And two of these women are their sister. And both of them are married to one of the Alban triplets. This woman right here is the sister to the Alban triplets. And she's married to one of these guys. So you think about it. How much does their Wednesday suck? It does a lot. She's going to lose a husband, a brother, or both. A husband, or brother, or both. A husband, a brother, or both. And they're still going to do this. The moral message here was do what's right, even when it's hard. Self-sacrifice. There's a really fancy Latin phrase called exemplum virtuitus. An example of virtue. This painting is about doing what's right, even if it's hard. And when people saw this, they read it. This meant overthrow the king. Right? Revolutions are not, generally speaking, uh, the product of the upper class. It's the lower class. Right? And it's the people who have a lot to lose in terms of the safety of their life that risk a lot. Now, I want to be really clear here because this painting did not cause the French Revolution, which begins in but a year. It doesn't begin it. It isn't the cause of it. But David has captured, and I'll use a really fancy German word here, the zeitgeist. The zeitgeist. Zeit um, is the German word for time, right? So, so there is a, um, a, a Berlin newspaper called the, Zeit, the, the Zeitling, which quite literally means the times. Geist, G-E-I-S-T, means spirit, right? So there's a bad movie made in 1982 called Poltergeist. <laughs> this painting captured the spirit of the times. It didn't cause the French Revolution. Yeah, it's a painting. Paintings don't do stuff like that. But paintings can be informed by the spirit of the times. And this one certainly was. People saw it. And it was the catalyst that brought people together. And within a matter of weeks of its display, the French Revolution is in full gear. And neither the king nor his head ever recovered. These paintings are a whisper away, 19 years. It's nothing. I know you don't believe me you're 17 or 18 or 19 or 20, but it's nothing in terms of time. Think about how different they are. Think about the difference now between a Rococo painting and a neoclassical painting. Pretty small, enormous, spring-like, autumnal, Everyone is happy. Everyone's going to die. Contemporary painting, classical painting, outside, Doric interior. When you go to the Louvre, and you should, you'll see another painting on the other side of the first one. It's got a really long name. You don't have to memorize, but memorize it, but I still like it. It's called Julius Brutus, first council, returned to his home after extension contempt is too given burial in 1789. But I like this one better. The lictors bringing back to Brutus the bodies of his sons. Because I can't remember that. I can remember that. Let's talk about this painting and how things are different. I want to show you Brutus. Now, there are two Bruti from the history of Rome. The Brutus you might be aware of 
is Julius Caesar's friend who betrayed him by stabbing him in the back. The phrase made famous by uh, William Shakespeare when Caesar turns to his friends and says, a two Brute, like, and you too, Brutus? That's not this Brutus. This is the Brutus from the founding of Rome, Brutus. And what you're looking at here in the middle is a, a, a ancient classical statue of Brutus, that Brutus, the historical Brutus, from the Capolini Museum. And again, the Capolini Museum is the museum in which I suspect David saw the earlier painting of the of the Battle of the Horatii and the Albans. And so I bet you three bucks he would have seen this statue because this statue has served as a reference for the the, the head of Brutus in the painting here. Brutus has been shown in a relatively interesting way. And because I care about a full experience for you, I show you a really bad drawing of a classical and now lost statue of Zeus, who sort of sits in judgment, facing the viewer, his arm and finger raised upwards. This sort of looks like Brutus, but I'll also give you a painting this. This is from the Vatican Museums. It's a, a painting by Raphael that we didn't really look at much, but it's from the School of Athens. And it's a depiction of, of uh, Heraclitus. And if we rotate him around, a little bit similar. This is a depiction from Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. And if we rotate this around a little bit, I think you can see that they're, they are somewhat similar. And even, I mean, not only in regards to the hand and the arm, but also look at the toesies, the ways in which their, their legs are wrapped around one another. Now, in order to understand this painting, we really have to understand the, um, the story that's going along. And here we go. During this, um, this early part of the Republic, there was a law on the books that pretty much says if you attempt to overthrow the, uh, um, the, uh, the ruler, you are killed. Right. It's a pretty simple, straightforward rule. And it also doesn't give you any sort of guidelines and says, but if you're the king's son, that's okay. So Brutus here has a problem because his sons have attempted to overthrow him. To put to put a really short to give it a really short story, he was a monarch. Changed the monarchy from to a republic, and that really sucks if you're the oldest son of the king because your whole life you've wanted to be king after he's dead, and now he says, you know, what, we're not going to do a monarch anymore. We're going to do a republic, and so as a way of securing his place on the throne, the sons attempt to kill their dad, and now dad is in a really tough spot. Because he has to do one of two things. Either acknowledge that the rule is false and not have them put to death or kill them. And if you're looking for a, an idea of what he did, here are the lictors, which is a fancy word for people carrying in dead bodies. And that guy's not taking a nap. Think about how, how um, Brutus has been shown right here. He's shown seated, passive in shadow and not really doing much. And think about how different that is compared to the women here on the right side of the composition. Because here we have mother and two daughters. And think about the ways in which she's being active, aggressive, reaching out. She's not passive, she's doing work. This is a different depiction of women, isn't it? Oath of the Harati, passive, Complacent, active, aggressive. Think about the men, active, passive. So what's the deal? Why is that important? Again, paintings don't change the world, but paintings often can contribute to them. So what work does this do? When this went on display in 1789 and did so at the Louvre, it kind of ca caused kind of a, a an upheaval. The French Revolution is going like crazy, and the king and queen have left Paris and have kind of locked themselves up um, in Versailles. One day, a group of women marched the 14 miles from Paris to Versailles, demanding to see the queen. 
the queen, Marie Antoinette, of course, she's not French. She's, she's Austrian, right? She hardly even speaks French for that matter, but she's an Austrian princess. And, and the women went out there and they went out there because they had no food. There was no, they were starving and, and they had no bread. And, Again, you know this, given my infatuation with bread baking, bread is not a hard thing to make, and it definitely does not require a lot. Flour, salt, yeast, and not a lot of salt and not a lot of yeast, let me tell you. So when I make a, a batch of bread, it's 500 grams of flour, 11 grams of salt, one gram of yeast. But if you don't have flour, you don't have bread. So they went out there demanded to speak with the queen. And they said, to the, the queen says, we don't have bread. And the guard took that message to the queen. And she says, well, if they don't have bread, just have them eat cake. I don't know if that's a true story. I, I like to think that it is because it gets told so often. But this idea that there was such a misunderstanding by the aristocracy and the rulers that they don't understand that maybe bread and cakes are made out of the same thing. And that if you don't have a baguette, you don't have a cupcake either. And so this was the beginning of the end of the French monarchy. And by the time the 1790s roll around, David is in full-blown revolutionary mode. He is employed in mass to make art for the First Republic of the French Empire. And one of the works he's famous for is this. It's the so-called Death of Marat. It was painted in 1793. It's in the Royal Museum of Brussels now and is totally worth your visit. And it's a cool, fun story in a lot of cool, fun, macabre ways. So... Marat was a, uh, a French journalist and revolutionary who ran a rabble-rousing newspaper called The People. And in 1792, I think it was the end of 1792, he was soaking in his medicinal bath one day. He had a, um, Jean-Paul Marat had a, uh, a, a painful skin ailment that required that he spend a part of every day soaking in a medicinal bath. And one day someone shows up to his, um, to his bath and, and requests to see him. And Marat's servant turns um, her away, but she leaves a note for him. Um, and, and the servant takes the note to Marat. And Marat says, the next time this woman comes, you may let her in. And so, so here is the note. And here it is turned on its side. And it's dated the 13th of July of 1793. So it was 1793 when this was painted, I beg your pardon. And it's from a woman named Anne-Marie Charlotte Corday. And it's written to the citizen Marat. And again, during the French Revolution, because there was a desire to get rid of your highnesses, people began to refer to one another as citizen, right? Citizen, the Soviet word for this is comrade, is a remarkably egalitarian term. Everyone is a citizen. No one's better than the other on the basis of, of your parentage or your wealth or your education. Everyone's a citizen. And she wrote to Marat, I am sufficiently unhappy to have the right to your benevolence. And on the backside, it would have continued. But she came there looking for help. So she was admitted into his bath chamber where he is soaking on, in his medicinal tub. And he is writing. It's what he did all day. He was a public intellectual, ran a newspaper. He wrote. And you can see here. He has a quill. You can see he's got a writing desk. You can see on that writing desk, there's an ink pot and some notes. And what you might not have noticed at first was the bloody knife there. David has painted his writing desk. And I want you to look at this for a second. It's made out of wood. It says, Ah, Marat. So to Marad. David, his own name, almost like to my friend Marat, from your friend David. And it says here on the bottom part, l'an du. And then you can sort of make it out 17 and over there 93. So I want you to think about this for a second. We have a rectangular object with a person's name on it and a year on it. What does that remind you of? How about this? 
I wrote a paper on this gravestone when I was in graduate school. We don't know the name of the carver, but we call him the wood, the Charlestown carver. And this is the Thomas Wharton stone from, dated in 17, 1708. Doesn't this sort of work as a kind of gravestone? That what we have is a memorial to a dead friend and, and David has painted him in a kind of heroic way. So for example, if you look at this image of Jean-Paul Marat, what does it remind you of? Is there anything, like what was David looking at? What do you think? And where was this painting? Let me think about it for a second. Oh, right, this painting was in Rome. This is Caravaggio's entombment. And I call your attention to that hand. What do you think? You think maybe David was looking at this and maybe not that. How about this? I wonder if David was thinking about this. So let me think about this. Where was this sculpture? Oh, wait a second. I know it was in Rome. And where did David spend so much time? Wait for it. Rome. And so David, like all of the artists, is building on the things that he sees, he has seen in his own life. And I think that's really fabulous. So Marat is a painting for the French Republic, but he also does stuff for Napoleon. And this is a great example of one of the early portraits of Napoleon done in 1797. And they're cool, they're fun, it's never finished, but the great ones are Napoleons on big horses. And so this is a really wonderful example of that. This is Napoleon crossing the Alps. And we'll spend a little bit of time talking about this on our way to talking about the Arc de Triomphe. So I give you Napoleon. Here's a detail on the right. I want you to think about words to describe Napoleon's physical appearance. How many of you thought short? I mean, we even have a phrase to describe short people who have a chip on their shoulder and act like they're tough guys. And we call it a Napoleon complex. So Napoleon, depending upon if you're British or French, ranged in height from five foot nine to like three foot two. Um, there's a, a fascinating exhibit at the, I think it was the MAS Museum in Antwerp that had sort of a breakdown of, of what people believe Napoleon's height was. Um, he was probably about five foot six, which makes him um, on the below average scale for French men during the early part of the 19th century. Like not ridiculously short, but short enough to where he probably had a chip on his shoulder. And again, how many times have I been on a horse? Zero. But look at Napoleon on this horse. First of all, if you're ever on a horse and the horse is making this face, you have every right to be scared out of your mind. Is Napoleon scared? No, sir. Napoleon's got this horse by the reins and he's pointing, I'm going that way, which is pretty amazing because it's a scary thing. Now, if the horse is rearing up like this, you also don't need to have this face. You're allowed to be terrified because the horse is likely going to throw you off it. And I pause here to ask you this question. How'd the horse get there? He's on the edge of a cliff. Did they back up the horse? like down this hill, like beep, 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 beep. Like Napoleon's got his arm on the, the, the headrest behind him, looking, looking behind to make sure he doesn't go over the cliff. And the horse starts, so he's like, stop. And the horse goes, Meh. and someone comes along and slaps the horse on the hind quarter and the horse dutifully rears. So Napoleon can do all of this. My goodness gracious, this is the most improbable painting we've looked at all day. A calm, gigantic Napoleon, on a small rearing pony. Here are Napoleon's troops. They're all pushing cannons up a mountain. And one of the things you might not have noticed at first are the names carved in rocks. Bonaparte, Napoleon. Carolinus Magnus, you know now. Charlemagne. Hannibal. Hannibal was a Carthaginian general that crossed the Alps on his way to Rome. This painting commemorates 
not one, but two, but three people who crossed their Alps on their victorious way towards Rome. And I got to be honest with you, it's not the most accurate representation I've ever seen of, of, of Napoleon. This was our image of Charlemagne, but it is it does fit in with the tradition of equestrian statues, right? Little guy on big horse shown gigantic on a pony. And did Napoleon cross the Alps? He did. Absolutely. Yeah, he did. He went to Rome. Actually, he, be, he crowned himself king of Italy for a while, which is kind of fun. Did he do so on a horse? Well, no. Horses don't climb mountains. Horses are not good mountain animals. You know what is? Donkeys. So Napoleon did, in fact, cross the Alps. He did so on a donkey because donkeys have stronger legs than horses. But you would never want to see Napoleon riding a donkey, would you? No, Napoleon wouldn't want to show himself riding a donkey. And so this shows a really interesting way of thinking about Napoleon on a horse. I'll show you this quickly, but we're going to move on. This is David's The Coronation of Napoleon. This thing is so enormous that you can hardly get far enough away to actually take a picture of it in the Louvre. So the, the oath of the Harati and the lictors bringing back to Brutus the bodies of his son are actually behind me in this photograph. And it shows Napoleon having already crowned himself emperor about to put the crown on that of Josephine, because that's how Napoleon rolls. So there's the there's um, Pius II, the Pope, doesn't look so happy with everything because the Napoleon wrote him a letter and said, hey, Pope, come to Rome and, and crown me emperor of the French. And the Pope wrote back and said, uh, what day is that? I think I'm busy. And Napoleon wrote back and said, I'm not asking. And so he made the Pope come to Ro Paris and in Notre Dame Cathedral, um, suggested that he um, that he crown him uh, and then took the job from him. And so that's actually not the Pope, I beg your pardon. That's the Archbishop of, P of, of Paris. And that's the Pope who just looks angry. All the, the maids, Napoleon's mom. And let's talk about this. My friends, this should look familiar. It's a great way to wrap up some neoclassicism because this is in the middle of Paris. It's there to this day. It was begun in 1806 and finished up with some sculpture in the 1830s. This is the Arc de Triomphe. It is the center part of this part here of Paris. It's called the Etoile, which quite literally means the star. When Paris was redesigned in the middle part of the 19th century by a man named Baron Haussmann, this was kind of made a central feature of Paris, including this long road here. And that road, which comes directly into Paris, is called the Champs-Élysées. Um, every year at the Tour de France, the, the race finishes with a couple of laps around this. By the time the riders get here, the race is already over. And it's just kind of a victory lap, but they do like eight laps around this. On one end, you have the, the uh, Arc de Triomphe and the other place here, you have the Place de la Concorde. There's a great big obelisk there. I mentioned the Tour de France and I think that's kind of interesting because I was here uh, at the Arc de Triomphe um, in, let me get the year right, 1999, 1999. And it was the first year that Lance Armstrong won the Tour de France. And I was there along the Arc de Triomphe that day. And I remember I went into the Swatch store and bought a watch, bought like this kind of chronograph watch. It was like a hundred bucks or something. But I remember standing there watching the bikers come around and they weren't biking super fast. I, I was sort of surprised, but it's because the race is pretty much over and they were just finishing things up. And so they were biking around and there was a, a British grandma uh, or pardon me, a French grandma standing beside me who was cheering and clapping as the people came by. And she was waving an American flag. And I thought this was really peculiar. So I asked her, and because back then in the day, I spoke French much better than I do now. And I, I asked her why she was waving an American flag, because Lance Armstrong was going to win. And the French don't dislike Americans. That's sort of a myth. They dislike people who don't speak French. <laughs> um, they really dislike people who are unwilling to say hello in French. So here's your go to Paris lesson. 
bonjour, au revoir. And if you can do that, you'll be okay. Um, but when you say bonjour, they'll know you're an American and they'll speak English to you because they speak better English than you ever will French. But I asked her in, in French why she was waving an American flag. And she looked at me and she pointed up and she said, at least I think this is what she said because she was speaking in French um, and you know me in French. And she pointed up and she said, I've lived here my whole life. And I was, and I remember in 1942, when the German army marched through the Arc de Triomphe. Now, let me say something about that. The Arc de Triomphe, as it exists uh, in, classic, in classical Rome, was an art, archway that was created so that a conquering ruler um, could return home and march through it in celebration. And the Arc de Triomphe, if we were to orient ourselves in terms of the city, is on the west bank of the Seine and the southern part of the city. And when the German army came to France, they could have easily marched through almost any other part of the city. But what they did instead was marched all the way around the northern part of France, of, of, of Paris, and came in on the western side of the city so that they could march through this. They went out of their way so that they could enter Paris through this thing, because this is the thing that this thing was made for. You march through a triumphal arch, I mean, you march in triumph. So she was there when the Germans did it. And then she stopped and her eyes started to tear up. And she says, and I was there in 1945, when the Americans came through the Arc de Triomphe. And I just sat there, and even now I'm getting a little emotional because it was such a moving story about like the goodness of the United States in the world at times, that this is a picture of, of a tank, an American tank coming through the Arc de Triomphe. Um, and this is not my grandfather, but that is what my grandfather did. He would be here and then out ahead of the tank reporting back to where things were. And so these buildings do work. Art does work. Like this thing that exists from the first century comes back 2,000 years later. And even 110 years after its construction, it still has the opportunity both to do that work in a sad way and to do that wake in a redemptive way. Man, art is amazing. When we come back next time, we're gonna shift gears, go back in time a couple of decades and talk about the crazy interaction between the neoclassical art, which we've looked at, and the romantic, romantic art that still is yet to come.